All right. This show is deeply personal to me. I have a lot of stories, but I don't like to talk about them. I know the pain. I can relate. I lived it. Maybe not to the degree of some victims, but I know how it starts. Growing up, I witnessed it, domestic violence in my family. So today, as hard as this is, I'm speaking my truth. I am a victim of domestic violence. I'm also a survivor. I got out before things got worse. But some women don't escape. Some women can't escape. I can feel your pain. It's personal. My own secret pain is now my purpose. No one could save me but me. I want you to know it's not your fault. You are not alone. For years and years, and sometimes now, I think it's my fault but I'm not to blame. I'm damaged, but I'm not broken. I took the control back. You can do it too. I promise it does get better. It does. That's my story. And here in Illinois, 37.7% of women and 25.7% of men will experience intimate partner physical violence, sexual violence, and or stalking in their lifetimes. This is a show to honor Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And now we are talking to survivors who have taken their own stand against domestic violence. Let's welcome Gabrielle Henley. Hi. Martin Nissen, Marilyn Kellum, and Megan Dudek. And also, Ryan. Yep, here to weigh in our experts, retired judge for the Cook County Domestic Violence Division, Yolande Bourgeois, and South Suburban Family Shelter Executive Director, Jennifer Gabrenya. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Some of thank you all are familiar faces, <laughs> but I just want to thank you for being here for this one. Gabrielle, we're going to start off with you. Okay. People thought you had the perfect family. Yeah. Boy, do I know what that's yeah. like. Mm -hmm. And when did you realize that something was wrong? It took a long time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like um, it was normal for me um, because the domestic violence didn't happen every day, right? So when people think of domestic violence like you're in it and this is happening every day, it didn't happen every day for me. It ha there was points where it didn't happen for years. And so for me, I didn't get out till I almost died. Mm. And, and what was that turning point? Ooh, the abuse had gotten to the point where I ended up in the hospital. I had to have emergency plastic surgery on my face um, because in my mind, I thought that it would always get better, not really knowing that, A, domestic violence is a choice and that it only gets worse. It progressively the physical part of it gets worse. It doesn't get better. So at that, it was at that point because um, he wasn't pushed towards violence. It wasn't like a big argument would happen and then the violence would start. It would just start. And so for that day, it just happened. And then at that point, I knew that was it for me. I needed to pursue trying to get him arrested, put in jail, and go through the whole nine yards, and I knew that I was done. Hmm. How long were you with this person? All my life. All of my life. He was my very first boyfriend. Oh. Um, so since the um, age of about 13, so we lived in community then. We lived around the corner from each other. This was somebody I knew. I knew his whole family. Um, we grew up together. 
So I've known him all my life. Wow. Right. Martin, I want to give you a chance to share your story. Not too many men want to even admit that they're a victim of domestic violence. So brave of you for you to be here for today. Talk about what you went through and how you ended up questioning your manhood. I mean, there's... Every, everyone has a story, you know, right. and, and my story, it was, I feel like I, I blame myself a lot and, mm -hmm. you know, I've been in communications with family members, you know, with mentors and they always tell me that it's not my fault, you know, that you can only control your actions mm -hmm. and that is something that I've had to learn from. Um, but uh, as far as manhood, it wasn't a, as in like a stereotypical like, oh, I'm a man. I need to, I need to show the world like I can come back from anything. No, it was, uh, it was more of an individualistic. It was human. Uh, my my humanity. I had to question what was I doing, mm -hmm. my decision making. When you when you, it was almost like an addiction going mm -hmm. back to that person, and that's something that I had to learn uh, to overcome. And you know, getting away from the bottle, getting away from those kind of vices that really put you in in the most vulnerable states. Right. I've had to learn from, and just watching your your uh, testimony, I, I, I was you know mm -hmm. tearing up because mm -hmm. everything you said yeah. is what I felt. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And. I'm in here with, with, with women that are stronger than at times that I feel like I ever was. Right. So thank you, ladies. Thank you for the opportunity. Right. Yeah. Was, your, was the abuse that you suffered more verbal or physical? And were you reluctant to tell your family and friends? It was uh, verbal. It was nonverbal at the same time. Because it, it, not necessarily saying, you know, harsh things or cursing one out, mm -hmm. but holding back information, not saying anything at all. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, leaving in the middle of the night and not, not telling a mm. person where you're going makes that other person question themselves and, and literally tear themselves apart inside yeah. and out. Mm -hmm. And then it started to get to the point where it became physical and that's why I knew I had to leave. Yeah. Because I couldn't, I, I don't want to be put up against the wall where I have to yeah. have that fight or flight. And right. being a man, I know that's going to look bad. I mean, how many how many times do we think of domestic violence and right off the bat we think, boom, what did he do? Right. Mm -hmm. it, not, it doesn't always start there. Right. What would you say to other men that are going through the same thing? I mean, listen to exactly what you said in yours. It's not your fault. Uh, find somebody, not, not necessarily a family member, not necessarily a friend, but find someone you can find confidence in and that can give you a a not not just telling you everything you're doing is right, but that's going to give you a third party perspective that can help you. And that's where it's all about. Wow. The brave of you again for you to be here. And thank you for sharing your story. Marilyn, you're out of a violent relationship. How has that relationship left an impact on you even to this day? The first thing that comes to mind is uh, financially. When you purchase a home with someone, and they threaten you, if you drop the charges, I'll pay the mortgage. Mm -hmm. And right. um, you're stuck with a mortgage, and uh, it financially ruins you. And so years later, um, it takes you time to recover. Right. And um, you can. Mm -hmm. You can. You will. Mm -hmm. I am. But it takes a long time. Well, you have to remember, that's why so many women feel like they stay because exactly. they don't have another option. They don't have the financial means. Where are they gonna go? You know, when you think about that, it makes a difference on whether you stay or you Absolutely. leave and you deal with that. Uh, do you still live a bit in fear? I used to. I used to. I would say as recent as last year. Okay. I was but now, I, wouldn't, I do not live in fear. I'm cautious, I'm aware as we all should be, but uh, I'm stronger now right. and I'm prepared. So I believe that the more prepared you are, the less fear you'll have. Mm -hmm. What are you looking forward to the most now in your new life? I look f I'm looking forward to my 5 a.m. workout class <laughs> at the Indiana State oh, Law I don't camp. look forward to that at all. <laughs> but listen, I look forward to Bible class tomorrow night at my church, Morgan Park Apostolic. The point is, I look forward to everything. Hmm. When you've been threatened and someone is uh, 
threaten to take your life. When you make it out, everything, even though the subject is really gloomy here, it's challenging. Yeah. I'm so excited to be able to breathe. Yes. And so to be here. Everything is exciting. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny that you say that, that because Ryan and I, of course, talk intimately all the time and, you know, as my brother. And I was saying to him, you know, we were talking about when I had to do that tape piece. And I said, Ry, one of the things that made it, it was like tears of sadness because I had to think back. Mm -hmm. But then it was also like, I'm so mm -hmm. free now. Yeah. And it's like tears of God, joy because yes. you, at the time when you're going through something, you never think you're going to get out. Never. You don't see it's the so end. Dark. All you see is the cloud yeah. over yes. you. But it's like, if we can just get that message across that it does get, get better. better. And it takes time it sometimes, but it gets better. A lot better. Very yeah. Good. Megan, yeah. we got to bring you into this conversation. Uh, when you decided to take a stand, what kind of support did you get? Or maybe I should say, what kind of support did you not get? Mm. That's a really good question. And I've given that a little thought. So it's difficult. Um, it does stick with you. Mm -hmm. um, I was supported by the responding officer. I wasn't mm -hmm. responded by the other, uh, responded well to the, by the other one. Um, what I was saying was minimized. And so even that moment where I'm standing there and I'm disheveled and torn and thrown all over and telling them there's a gun in the house yes. that was just held to my head, um, I have an officer saying, went into the house and comes out laughing and said, what? He said, what? Laughing at me. Um, that was very difficult. Not everyone responds that way. I know that. Um, the judge in the court supported me, but I was already gone. Um, my family, if it wasn't for them, it, I think this would have been a, a little, a little... Different outcome? Yes. Um, count, South Suburban Family Shelter. Yes. See, I'm going to cry because it's very important to me. Yes. Um, to feel that safety when that door locked behind you, mm -hmm. when you went for service. Mm -hmm. That, that, that was when I could put my back and not worry about where I was mm -hmm. um, and who was behind me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to bring in Jennifer and I want to bring in our judge as well and let's talk mm -hmm. about some of the programs and, and what we can do legally. Your Honor, what, what can someone do if they're being abused? What's the first thing they should do? Well, the first thing is call the police. Number one, a lot of people skip that step. Number two, you go to a courthouse and you get yourself an order of protection, which can be granted on an emergency basis for 21 days. The defendant does not have to be notified. Yeah. You come in and at 555 West Harrison there are all kinds of services available. They have a legal clinic, they have victim witness people, they have people who can direct you to shelters and things like that. So there's a lot of support there, but you just have to Make up your mind, you're going to take advantage of it. And um, I mean, you'd be surprised the number of men, women, whoever, come in, get that initial order, and either don't show up on the next court mm -hmm. date or come in and say they want to drop the charges. And as a judge, there's nothing I can do. You know, I can talk to them from the bench and, bottom line, let them know I'll be here when you come back. Right. Because and they nine, do come back. They do come back. I mean, I had a few that I would call frequent flyers because mm -hmm. they were there all the time. Mm -hmm. And that woman, it took a miracle to get her to testify mm -hmm. finally against this guy. Mm -hmm. And then he's locked up and he's calling her, mm -hmm. threatening her. Not realizing, I guess, that the phones are tapped in right. the jail. Right. And the state's attorney's going to get a copy yeah. of that transcript. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Now you're going to get charged with a felony. Mm -hmm. So. But there are all kinds of resources. But the first thing is to call, call the police. If you have a, if the offender is not on the scene when the police arrive, so they can't make an arrest, they will still give you a police report number. With that number, you go down to the courthouse and the state's attorney will talk to you and will file a criminal complaint if warranted, as well as giving you an order of protection. Mm -hmm. And so. Jennifer, I want to ask you about the South Suburban Family Shelter and the programs that you offer so that people that are in these relationships and these abusive 
you know, situations can get help. Right, so at South Suburban Family Shelter, we offer an array of services. Our primary goal is, I think, alluding to what Megan said, is to provide that sense of safety. Mm -hmm. When people come to us, not all of them have chosen to call the police. Um, we have quite a few people who, unfortunately, are afraid of what the police response is going to be. Mm -hmm. We serve a large immigrant population, and mm -hmm. especially right now in the current climate, they don't feel like calling the police is safe for them. Right. So we provide that kind of safety. We provide counseling services. We provide case management services. We do have have that emergency shelter service and a hotline service. We have seven programs, so it goes, <laughs> it's pretty extensive what we do. Um, and we also have housing services for more of a long term, so transitional housing, rapid rehousing. Our ultimate goal is for people to be sustainably safe. We don't want them to be safe just for a moment. Yes. We want them to be able to have safety for the rest of their lives. And that is so important. And thank you all for being here mm -hmm. and sharing your stories. Uh, Judge Alon and Jennifer are going to be sticking around with us. Coming up next, a story that was covered in publications across the country, the tragic loss of Chicago and Donna Alexander. Yep, and then a little bit later, a Chicago organization working with abusers to stop domestic violence before it starts again. We'll be right back. Thank you.